Tonight we're going to be covering the last angel that is commissioned to sound the trumpet to the earth. And there is something of a mystery that's going to be accomplished. As this trumpet sounds, there will be a shaking on the earth like the world has never seen. As Jesus begins to set up his reign from the heaven entering onto earth. Time for judgment has ripened and God's people and their answers to prayer or their their cry out to prayer is about ready to be answered. Tonight is the seventh trumpet. It's a turning point in the book of Revelation. You guys with me tonight? Let's talk about the uniqueness of the seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet is a standalone trumpet just like the seventh seal was a standalone seal. And just like the seventh seal directed us to God or directed us to God in prayer to release the seven trumpets, now it's the seventh trumpet will also direct the seven bowls of wrath which will follow. But unlike the seventh seal, there's a unique intensity about the seventh trumpet that is totally different than all the other judgments. As promised, the seventh trumpet contains the final woe that the angel had said would happen. Revelation chapter 10, verse five, it says, then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it. And he said, there will be no more delay. Everybody say, no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished. Circle, the mystery of God will be accomplished. Just as he announced to his servants, the prophets, This angel that John is seeing unveils to us a few different things about the seventh trumpet. Number one, there's an expected promise. Number two, there's a specific time frame. And number three, there's a mystery that needs to be accomplished. The first one is an expected promise. Notice that this angel is swearing by God and telling the truth. I'm swearing by God, as it were. Notice he said, I swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it. So this angel is saying, I'm swearing by God that this seventh trumpet is going to be mighty. What's the specific time frame? Notice that the angel says this, in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound the trumpet, in the days... We don't know if days is a literal, you know, 24 hours. And we don't know if days is literally just the season of the end times of the seventh trumpet, which could be a period of months. We don't know. Regardless, something remarkable is about ready to happen in this time frame. And what is that something remarkable that's about ready to happen? Some type of a mystery is going to be accomplished. Again, the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet. The mystery of God will be Accomplished. What is this mystery of God? We have to ask ourselves. What is going to be accomplished? The seventh trumpet will fulfill a specific mystery that was already told to us by God's prophets of the old, in which the text says, Could this seventh trumpet, could it be the anticipated second coming of Christ? I don't know. I don't know. But lots of people say it is. Now, how many of you guys know the best tool to interpret Scripture is Scripture? If you want to understand what the Bible says, you got to open up the Bible and read it for the full context, not just of what you're reading right there in the passage, but what does the Old Testament say? What do other passages say? What do other authors that God used to write the inspired Word of God, what do they say on the matter? And is everything like a puzzle piece all lined up together to create this picture, a global picture of what the return of Christ looks like. We already know from the Old Testament that the prophets of old foresaw and declared a great and dreadful day of the Lord. It's great for believers who've been crying out, Jesus come, and it's dreadful for the wicked who are saying, hide us from the wrath of God. The prophets of the old would say the great and dreadful day of the Lord would be a time where the wickedness would be judged, God's people would be vindicated by a righteous king, 
who would be the savior of God's people and would rule the nations. We understand that from the prophets of the Old Testament, and that's why they didn't understand Jesus of the New Testament, because Jesus of the New Testament came as a servant, as a humble servant. They were saying, where's the righteous reign? Why are our enemies still around? You're supposed to wipe the earth, and you're supposed to let, you're supposed to let your kingdom rule in a physical manner. How many of you guys know Jesus had to come and save people first before he would have a people to reign with? So we got to surrender our lives to Jesus at his first coming in order to enjoy reigning with him in his second coming. So we also know that John, the apostle John, in Revelation is acting as a prophet. In Revelation, the seventh trumpet is the very last trumpet mentioned in the Bible. The next judgments found in the book of Revelation are all the bowls of wrath that are being poured out rapidly, swiftly against the Antichrist and his empire as Jesus begins to really prepare the ground, as it were, for releasing his reign in a physical sense. Therefore, the seventh trumpet is the last trumpet mentioned in the book of Revelation. So what did Jesus say about his return? And as we correlate what Jesus says and what Paul says to what John says at the sounding of the seventh trumpet, again, could this seventh trumpet be the return of Christ? Well, this is what Jesus said about the trumpet, a trumpet, in Matthew 24. In verse 30, it says this. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky, with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call. You might want to circle trumpet. And they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens all the way to the other. So Jesus makes reference to this trumpet and his return, that it's going to be a loud trumpet call, and he will gather his elect from the earth. But what did the Apostle Paul say. So Jesus says there'll be a trumpet sound. And now we're gonna go ahead and look at the Apostle Paul. He's looking at end times through maybe a different lens, but nevertheless, it has the same outcome. First Thessalonians chapter four. And you might wanna just leave your thumb in there because we're gonna go back to it a little bit later in tonight's message. It says this in verse 16. And talking about the return of Christ, it says, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet, and with the trumpet call of God. Might want to underline trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and left on the earth will then be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Don't freak each other out with these words. Now, so Jesus mentions a trumpet. Paul mentions a trumpet. Now just flip just a couple books backwards and go to 1 Corinthians 15. I, I definitely, I want you to turn there. Go turn to 1 Corinthians 15. And notice verse 51. Again, Paul's speaking again. He's speaking now to the Corinth church. And notice these words. He says, listen, I tell you a mystery I tell you a mystery, circle mystery. I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last, what does that say? At the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. So John says there's going to be a mystery accomplished in the book of Revelation, some type of mystery is going to hit the earth when that last trumpet sounds, and it's going to awaken the earth to something. Jesus says when you hear the trumpet, that's when, the, that's when he's going to g gather the elect from the earth. Paul mentions the trumpet, and Paul even goes further and says the mystery, a mystery will be revealed. The mystery, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 51, the mystery is the last trumpet and us being caught up together and being changed in the twinkling of an eye. And so when you read all these New Testament scriptures side by side, 
it appears maybe that the seventh trumpet might be the actual return of Christ. And I want to go ahead now and clarify the rapture. I want to clarify the rapture. Although the idea of the rapture can be concluded from reading certain scriptures, do you know the word rapture is not even mentioned in the scriptures? We get the term rapture from the Latin translation from the phrase being caught up. Again, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive on planet earth will be caught up together. The, the, the phrase caught up together is where we get the word rapture. And according to the scriptures that we just read, Jesus is not trying to hide anything when he comes back. The rapture is not a secret event. In fact, it's a very loud event. How many of you guys know the trumpet sounds of God? And the angels, you know, blasting these things? It's going to be loud. The apostle Paul said it was going to be loud. Jesus said it was going to be loud. The apostle John in Revelation says it's going to be Loud, the trumpet will be very loud. You know, many Christians seem to have an innocent, unspoken, and perhaps may not even be aware of a faulty belief system that appears to look more forward to the rapture than the return of Christ. And I, and, and I don't want, maybe it's just semantics. There's different views on it. But a lot of people get very excited, and it seems to me, that, here's a question that comes my way. Billy, what's your view on the rapture? Where's the rapture in all of this? And can I pose something to you? I think that's the wrong question to be asking. You see, because I notice that people, some people, get more excited about a rapture and getting caught up out of here than they do against, do then being caught up to meet the Lord. Jesus, I think the right question should be is, when do you think Jesus is going to come back? Because we're being raptured not to get sucked up out of here and leave forever. We're getting raptured up to meet the Lord. It's the Lord that we want. It's not just escaping the earth. I want to know him. And so Jesus is wanting us not to get confused. It's not going to be a secret event. It says every eye is going to see. Every ear is going to hear. The whole world's going to mourn. They're going to see. And, and we're going to be caught up. The other thing I want to clarify with the rapture is that it's not poof theology. Everybody say poof. We watch these movies. I know you've seen them. I know you read books. And all of a sudden, poof. Airplanes are crashing. People wake up. Oh, did my kids get kidnapped? Why? Because their clothes are left behind. We see movies like this. And I'm not, I'm not trying to offend. Hear me. I'm not trying to offend. But the rapture is not about poof theology. Poof. I don't know. Where do they go? I don't know. But now I better repent and listen to a, a, an old Blu-ray of some pastor preaching and get my life back to, uh, together to serve Jesus before it's really too late. It's not poof theology. Poof, we're gone. There have been people caught up or raptured in the Bible Again, the best scripture to support scripture is scripture. The people who were raptured eventually did leave the earth, but they did not just suddenly poof. Where do they go? I don't know. Poof, they're gone. And so a lot of people who believe kind of in this poof theology of the rapture, they point to Enosh and Elijah. And so I'll just read this. I'm reading an Enosh and how he was caught up to the Lord from the Old Testament. It says, by faith, in Hebrews 11:5, by faith Enosh was taken away so that he did not see death. It was not found because God had taken him. Nothing is described about how Enosh of the Old Testament was taken away. There's not enough scriptural support to support a poof theology. It may be safe to conclude that somebody was there to see God take him away. In other words, if somebody went missing, people do not automatically assume that God took them. If someone's missing, are you just going to assume, oh, God took them away. God took them home. I know we use that phrase when someone passes away, God took them home. But did you see them, like, vanish? Poof. 
No, you usually go to call, if someone disappeared, you're gonna call out a search, you're gonna get a search warrant, you're gonna get a neighborhood watch, you're gonna get people out searching. So I believe somebody had to see Enosh be taken away in order for it to be recorded in the scripture that God took him away. Then you got Elijah. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11, it says, Then it happened as they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire. I like that verse. And separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven, and Elisha saw it. And he cried out. Elisha saw Elijah being carried up. It wasn't like, where did he go? Poof, he's gone. Then again, these two prophets that we talked about in Revelation. It says, again, after three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them. They stood on their feet, terror struck those who saw them, of course. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. So the world is seeing the people at least these two prophets being caught up into the heavens. They're seeing it with their eyes. It's not, where did they go? I don't know. And then ultimately you have Jesus. Jesus is the clearest one who modeled to us what the rapture will possibly look like. In Acts chapter one, verse nine through 11, Jesus had already descended and he already resurrected and now he's gonna ascend. And when he had spoken these things, While they watched the apostles, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. So people, the disciples saw Jesus being carried back up, as it were, as a cloud received him. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, so the disciples are seeing Jesus being raptured, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in a like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Notice his disciples saw him go to heaven. So what is the progression of the rapture? The progression of the rapture. Again, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive or left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so we will be with the Lord forever. First, we will see the Lord. This is what the rapture is going to look like. First, you will see the Lord. You will see the Lord in the same manner he went up, will be in the same manner he goes down. You will first see the Lord. Then number two, the dead in Christ will rise from their graves. They will not look like dead zombies. They will have resurrected bodies. This is not zombie fest, okay? And then as we are witnessing all of this, the Lord in the sky, the dead believers being raised from their grave, we too will be caught up together with them to meet God in the air. At this, the nations of the earth will look and they will mourn. They will mourn Now, I encourage you to study this topic yourself, but it's interesting to note that in church history, prior to the 1800s, most people considered the rapture and second coming one event, just one event. When you see Jesus, we go up to meet him. But somewhere at the late of the 1800s, we began to separate the rapture from the second coming as two separate events. And so you have some people in church, we've got, we went over the seven seals, and now we've gone over the seven trumpets. You have some people, and this is a, a prevalent belief out there, some people really believe that the rapture is separated from the second coming, and so the rapture happens at the first, before we even hit the seven years, right before the first three and a half years world peace, that the church is caught up, and then we come back down with Christ at the end. And so a lot of people say, well, Proponents of that would say, you know what? Then that's really three comings of the Lord, (laughs) right? We believe in the third coming. The second coming, we meet with the Lord, half in the air, poof, we disappear, and then we come back with the Lord for his third coming. So that's what proponents of that argument would say. And then there's the belief that this is the seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet might be where God returns, and we go up to meet the Lord in the air, and during this time, there is a 30-day procession. 
The Bible makes it clear that there's 1,290 days, and at other places it says that there's 1,260 days. Each of those equal three and a half years, but there's a 30-day gap. And so there's a belief out there that says during this, during this time when the church is raptured up to meet the Lord in the air, it's during those 30 days that the bulls of wrath are being pounded on the Antichrist empire to set up the ground, as it were, for him to touch down, go to Jerusalem with the saints, and begin to reign and rule for the millennium, the thousand-year reign. We're going to get to that in the future weeks. The seventh trumpet, very unique. And then some people believe that when Jesus returns, it will be at the end of the bowls of wrath and their church will be caught up. But regardless, we're still heading towards Jerusalem, as it were. So let's go ahead and just hit the seventh trumpet and then we'll close real quick here. You guys with me? Quite intriguing stuff, is it not? Revelation 11. We'll end here in about four minutes. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet And there was a loud voice in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become now the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. To me, this sounds like Jesus is coming to reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who were seated on the thrones before God, they fell on their faces and they worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord, God Almighty, the one who is and was, because you have taken your great power and you have now began to reign on the earth. The nations were angry and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, your saints, those who reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within this temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes and lightnings and rumblings, peals of thunders, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. So there's heavenly proclamations at the seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet blasts, and the sound is depicted as being loud. The attitude of heaven about this event is one of praise and thanksgiving. They're not sad. They're like, this is what it's all about. You are avenging your people. It's the earth that you created. You deserve to reign on the earth. You deserve to bring heaven with it. You deserve to reign with the saints who have given you all their hearts, their devotion throughout their lifetime. They've resisted hardship. They've resisted temptation. They stumble through the way. They zigzag their way, but they continue to run the race. He's going to reign with us forevermore. He wants the people who are after him because your heart is for him. He doesn't want people programmed to love him. He wants you to love him out of the choices of your heart in a world that resists him. Amen? Amen. And so now there's a reason for praise. You can give the Lord a clap offering. There's a reason for praise. It says, we praise you, the one who is and the one who was. They're praising him for his inauguration that's about ready to hit the earth. He has great power, it says, and he's beginning to reign on the earth. He's going to show this end time Pharaoh who's really God. They praise him for the justice that will be expressed in his wrath with the seven bowls of wrath that will be poured out. If you guys thought Jesus threw down a a whooping in the releasing of these trumpets, now it is very clear. When these bowls of wrath are poured out, it's going to be swift, it's going to be furious, all of heaven's rejoicing, all the saints on the earth who are alive, devoted to God, is rejoicing, either because we're seeing Jesus pour out these wrath from the sky, as it were, or whether or not he hasn't returned yet. I don't know, but I do know this. The bowls of wrath are going to be fury pulled, against, pulled out against Satan in his reign on the earth through the Antichrist and that end time, end time Pharaoh. And just like it was when God delivered his people out of Egypt, so it will be when God delivers his people out of global, international chaos and rulership from this end time Pharaoh. And God's going to throw that Antichrist back to the pit of hell where he belongs with Satan, I'm sorry, with his false prophet, and he's going to set up his reign for the thousand years. You don't want to miss the four bowls of wrath that's going to be poured out on the beast next session. Amen? Let's all stand.